we are here this morning because of how great he is. Glad that you're here. We're reading through the Bible, and I gave a little pep talk yesterday about being halfway through. We've just crossed that halfway mark, and uh, you need to gear up and push forward. When you hit the middle point, it's a little bit hard. And uh, gear up, push yourself. If you're behind, that's okay. You got a half a year to catch up. So spend a little bit of time, get caught up, read with us. Read the readings of the week, and then as you have some special time, maybe on your Sabbath, you can go back and, and read and catch up some of that other part and get with us. We, uh, <clears throat> we finished the book of Kings, Second Kings, this week. Uh, the last part of it, yesterday we looked at 20 of the kings from chapter 13 through 25. Most all of them were evil kings in the sight of the Lord. And we watched uh, to see what God did because of a nation that had turned their back on God. Uh, today I want to look at Acts. We've been in Acts, I think, the last three Sundays. I'd like to continue a little bit in the book of Acts. There's some fascinating things to me in the study in the book of Acts. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me uh, to Acts, we're going to begin... Uh, in uh, Acts 18, 19, right in there, and we're going to jump around a little bit, look at some of the things that are the miraculous things that God was doing during this time in the life of the apostles, and including Paul, Saul. We'll look at that. Now, the book of Acts, we've looked at and, and realized that most of your Bibles say Acts, or the book of Acts. Some say the Acts of the Apostles, and that's really what it's describing and writing about is this new thing about the way, as it's been translated into English, uh, forerunners of what Christianity would become, uh, the way. Uh, but it was the Acts of the Apostles, which really, I think, is more the Acts of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit was doing in them. Uh, it seemed to be a sign of God's providence and God's work in their lives was that of the Holy Spirit. So we uh, would call it the acts of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Uh, it was written, uh, we believe, by Luke, who was a physician, and we've gone through these before in our, in our introduction to it. Uh, he was a Gentile, uh, probably from Greek descent, and we're going to look at some of the, the actions of what the Holy Spirit did in Greece, uh, Mas Macedonia uh, of that time, Greece of our, of our day. It was written to Theophilus, and Theophilus uh, could be a man's name, and it could be uh, interpreted, it means the friend of God. So it may open the door to it being written to all of us. I believe it was written to all of us anyway, even if it was personally written to a, a person in the beginning. Uh, but some theologians believe that it was just addressed to the friends of God, uh, Theophilus. It was written uh, before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, uh, right preceding that, more than likely. We don't have a date. We'll, we go from 62 to 70 in that span in through there. Now today I want to turn our thoughts to Paul, or Saul. Uh, he, he plays a, an important role in the book of Acts. Uh, this is our friend Kenneth Wyatt's uh, rendition of what Paul would have looked like in his older years and uh, uh, sitting, writing. I don't know if that's even close, but it gives you a visual to think about this man that, that we're looking at. Um, his Jewish name was Saul, or Saul, Shaul, and that means, uh, his parents gave him that name, means prayed for, or it, it means uh, ask for or even can mean borrowed. So Saul, uh, his Hebrew name, and remember uh, he was born in uh, Tarsus of Cilicia, which is not in Israel, but he was of a Jewish family. 
um, he possibly got his name Saul being named after King Saul. Uh, he is a Benjamite as well as Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, his namesake may have, may have come from there. We don't know that, but it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. According to the book of Acts, he inherited a, a Roman citizenship from his father. Oh, he uses the fact that he's a Roman citizen a lot in his, uh, in his sharing, uh, in his ministry, in these uh, missionary journeys. Uh, it comes in very handy to him uh, in being in Rome and that area. Um, as well as being a Jew with Jewish heritage. And uh, we know that his conversion came on the road to Damascus. Uh, he was going to persecute uh, the, the Jews, going to arrest them, bring them back, and have them put in prison. And a, a vision or the Yeshua himself appeared to uh, Saul on the road with a blinding light. Uh, he fell to the ground and he asked, who is this? And Yeshua said, this is the one that you're persecuting. And his life changed from that point. He was blinded for three days and then his sight was regained and we see a change. He kind of goes off the the radar for a, a bit there as he is studying and he's re reconciling all of this in his life. Uh, you realize that uh, he tells us in the book of Acts that he was a student of Gamaliel. Uh, that's one of the most famous rabbis of all times. That's the Hillel uh, sector of Judaism even today. Uh, Gamaliel was uh, the most renowned teacher of that day and maybe of all times. It was a great honor to be selected as a student of his. Saul, being from another country in Tarsus, came at a young age uh, to Jerusalem and became a student of Gamaliel. Now historians, Eusebius uh, particularly writes and tells about Gamaliel, and he says that he was very strict and his entrance into his school was almost unbelievably hard. That he only took the best of the best, the elite. Uh, they had to be able to quote uh, all of the, uh, the books of the law. Uh, Gamaliel would just, in conversation with them, he would start a passage and would expect them to pick it up there and just go forward. Uh, they had to have a great understanding, not just being able to quote it, but an understanding of how the scripture worked to become a student of his. Very interesting as a young boy. So I guess we would say that Saul uh, was a part of the Ivy League schools of his day, top of his class. He was a really smart guy. He was well educated. He grew up in Tarsus which had probably the strongest university system of that day uh, and in a very strong family for learning and studying God's Word, studying the law. So here's Saul and he is, he is adamant about his religion. He knows the Word, he works, he studies under Gamaliel, and we find Gamaliel in Acts as the leader of the Sanhedrin. He stands up and he, he makes a, several statements as leader of the religious sect. Saul is a part of that, and he is adamant about persecuting these people who he believes are De causing the demise of Judaism or bringing in a new thought that the Messiah has come and in, was in the person of Yeshua uh, and he's resurrected and gone to be with the Father and will return. That was heresy as far as Judaism believed. And so Saul was very strong in that. We see him his first time at the stoning of Stephen. 
and uh, we know he was persecuting. Now his conversion happens on the road to Damascus, and, uh, and God changes his life forever. He is very influential in what we know about that time period, about what we call the New Testament era. About uh, half of the book of Acts is written about Paul. Now it's Paul and Silas and Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and others that are in, involved in there. But a big part of Acts uh, is about Paul. Fourteen of the 27 books in the New Testament are credited to Paul's writings. So we've got half of Acts, half of the New Testament uh, have to do with Saul, whose name was changed to Paul. Now, tradition, and uh, as I grew up learning that Paul, Saul was his name until he met the Messiah, and then after that his name changed to Paul. Historians will tell you that that's probably not the way it was, that Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul was his Greek name. That was very common in that day, that in the trade and what all the things that they were doing uh, in, in uh, Tarsus and that area, that they would have a Greek name and then they would have a, a Hebrew name. Uh, so we're not positive about that, but that's uh, uh, the way it looks. Now I'd like to go in, and we're going to start in Acts chapter 17 and just see what the Holy Spirit is doing. Well, this is the Acts of the Holy Spirit, right? And see what they're doing and how Paul's life has been transformed. Now you remember when he, when he uh, was converted, he lost his eyesight and for three days was blind. Then when he regained his eyesight, he asked to be baptized, and he was baptized, and at that point filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And from that point, he, he began to teach and, and share with people about what it is to have this living Christ come and live within you in the form of the Holy Spirit. So as soon as this is we're going to get... Uh, in Acts 17, start with verse 10, if you'll follow in your scriptures there. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. Now, I, I transgressed a little bit here because we started reading in 18 this week, but I wanted to pick up this story just very quickly and add it in there. Uh, it's saying as soon as it was night, and the reason is that uh, Paul and Silas... Uh, were, were in, uh, in trouble and had been put in prison. <laughs> and you'll remember at Philippi, the Philippian jailer was there. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing and, and uh, evangelizing in the prison and a great earthquake came. And they talked and had all the prisoners stay there. And the, the guard, the head man, came and he was converted as well as his whole family. Well, Paul and Silas were out of jail, but things were really bad there in Philippi. So as soon as it was night, they sent him away and went on to Berea. Um, let me show you a map, and uh, this is an overview of this missionary journey, and I know it's a little bit big to see, so I'm going to zoom in on that top left-hand corner up there, and that's really where we're, we're watching right now. And uh, Troas, if you can see my pointer, uh, is where Paul received the Macedonian call, what we would call that, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And they went across and went into, into Philippi. If I can't get my, there we go. Into Philippi, if you'll see Philippi right up there. That's where they were in jail. And they, they at night sent them away and go all the way around to Berea. Now they made a, a stop, stop over in a couple of places very quickly. But on this journey, they went to Berea way over here in modern-day Greece. So we see them in, uh, in Berea. We'll pick back up with that verse, verse 10. 
As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. On arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, this is, uh, stands out to me more and more now as we've been studying the, the roots of our faith and realize that the way or Christianity or the understanding of the Messiah being uh, God himself and salvation being through him was not a deviation from Judaism. It's just that they did not accept that step of it. And th those that believed in the Messiah were still immersed in, and Saul being so uh, immersed in Judaism from the student of Gamaliel, the natural thing for them to do was to associate with those of like mind and like faith and to share with them. So all the way through the book of Acts, you're going to find over and over and over. On Shabbat, they went to the, to the synagogue and they taught. Now, uh, if, if uh, our studies and tradition tells us the truth, uh, the way they did the synagogues on Shabbat uh, back in the days of Paul and Saul, very similar to what they do now. They would go and they would have a reading of the scripture. Now, you remember that most people didn't have a copy. They didn't have their own Bible that they carried. They didn't have a scroll. So the only way they got to hear or see the scripture would be at the synagogue on Shabbat or daily in the yeshivas as they studied, but generally on Shabbat. They would all go. There'd be a reading through of the scripture. They followed a reading plan. Now, we're following the one-year Bible that goes all the way through the scriptures, and they followed the traditional Torah, uh, and, and it varies. Some people disagree of, of which passages they read, but they're pretty generic and, and pretty uh, sure of which passages they read. Uh, for instance, they, they can... Uh, tell us dates of when they believe Yeshua was there and read from Isaiah because of when it would fall in the year of the Torah readings. Oh, Paul and Silas went to uh, the synagogue on Shabbat and they listened to the reading of the scriptures. The, the tradition would be read all the scriptures. There would be a selected person that would read uh, and sometimes various ones. And then after it was over, there would be a time of dialogue or someone addressing the group. So Paul and Silas would go, they would listen to the reading of the scriptures, and then they would have an opportunity as guests to address the people about the reading of the day. And so they would take their knowledge of the scriptures and explain to them about the Messiah who had come. So on their arrival, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica since they welcomed the message with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, until I began to look at the cultural things and understand how in the world did they examine the scriptures daily if they didn't have a scripture? Well, they were probably going to a yeshiva of some kind of a, going back to the synagogue or another place of study. And these Bereans were really intent on knowing God's word. So this verse to me explains that they came and they heard Paul and Silas. And they said, I hadn't heard that before. Let's go and see what the scripture says about that. Let's dig in. They didn't deny it. They didn't accept it. They went and studied it out for themselves. Folks, I believe that's what we need to be. And that phrase has been coined that be a good Berean. Don't take what I say. Listen to it. Don't reject it. Go dig into your word and find what God's word has to say. It says they did this with eagerness and they examined the scripture daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed. Now, why did they believe? Because Paul was such a great orator and a brilliant guy, and he studied with Gamaliel, and now he converted to the way. No, they believed because they went and found the foundation of it in the Scripture, and they studied the Scripture and came up with the facts that Yeshua 
was truly the Son of God. He had been crucified, buried, raised from the dead, uh, ascended to heaven, and was the way of salvation. Well, these, uh, th these believed, as well as a prominent Greek women and other men believed what was going on in Berea. Great revival broke out there. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that God's message had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and disturbing the crowds. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions from Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. I threw that in, even though that was last week's readings, just to remind us, most of you have heard uh, and studied that before, that we need good Bereans. There's every imaginable teaching about God's Word and about how we dissect that and how we look at it. We need to listen and then we need to go and study it out for ourselves and make sure what God wants in our lives. Now I'd like to move to chapter 19, which was this week's readings, and look at it very quickly. While Apollos was in Corinth, verse 1 of chapter 19, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. Now, let's go back to our map and see if we can locate Ephesus uh, on it. And it's uh, right in this little area right here, if you can see my, my pointer. Ephesus, the name is right there, okay? So it's a long way away from Berea, way up there in the corner down over here. Now, some of the things that we know about Ephesus, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, place. And uh, Ephesus uh, was a center of the worship of Diana. Uh, the scriptures use the word Artemis, which is another term for the Greek goddess of fertility. And uh, I pulled this verse on a little bit further. I don't, don't think we'll get that far, but I wanted us to see it just in introducing about Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, um, a great center of trade, a, a real strong economic area, and it was a center of worship of pagan gods. And Paul goes there. Uh, later on in verse 35, it says, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? I find this very interesting as I've been studying a little bit more about Islam and a little bit more about the, the powers that are uh, converging now uh, that are the same as they were in the very beginning in the scripture of the good and evil, uh, God against Satan, and, and the religions against each other that line up with each other. Um, in Ephesus, uh, depending on what, what nationality or what language you spoke, you would have worshipped here at this uh, uh, mosque, we might say, and you would have bowed before Artemis, or some of them would have said it was Diana, or some of them would have said Isis. Very interesting how this is resurging again. Um, also, it's tied in and it says uh, this is the center where the image that fell from heaven was worshipped. And if you know anything about uh, Mecca and the cobblestone there, on the corner of it, which is what they come and, and worship, is a meteorite that fell from heaven. And some people would say and have some great arguments that this may be the same stone 
that was in the temple in Ephesus that was worshipped there of Isis. And it's been carried to, uh, to Mecca. Don't know that that's a fact or not at all. But there's an association here of this meteorite, possibly, that fell from heaven that was involved in the worship in Ephesus. And Paul comes into an area that is a pagan worship area, very dominant and very strong in that area. Now let's see what happens as we get to this in chapter 19. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then, uh, what baptism were you baptized with? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus or Yeshua. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. Now we see little snippets all through Acts about the Holy Spirit. What's it doing? It's coming. They believed in the resurrected Christ. They believed in repentance. John preached repentance. They accepted by faith God himself. They were baptized in the baptism of repentance, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. I find that interesting. Many of us grew up in faiths that said if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've received the Holy Spirit. These people had not. They believed in faith, but then with the, the laying on of hands and praying, they received the Holy Spirit, and when they did, they began to see miracles around them and began to see them happen. Now it says there were about 12 men of them. It spread quickly, and there was a great revival of people coming and understanding what was happening. Now I want to skip down to verse 11. Talking about the power that's coming that Paul is a part of in receiving the Holy Spirit and sharing that, that knowledge with others. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hand. Now, I'm, I'm at a point now that I, I believe that we're going to see in the end times extraordinary power from the Holy Spirit. I think there's several evidence in the scripture of that and that we're going to see a resurgence. I believe we're in the time we looked in the Kings where God had turned his back or God had withdrawn his power, withdrawn his presence as people, uh, as the nation turned their back on God, walked away from God. We see a, a falling away. We see less and less of God's power and less and less of God's miracles. Uh, generally only associated with maybe a prophet here and there, and then not really dominant. But in this instance in Acts, there is a huge display of power. I believe personally that we're going to see a resurgence of the, the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe we're going to see miracles that happen. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking and studying with in intensity in these places of how they've happened in the past so that I may become aware of what God wants to do in my life and in your life and in these last days. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, I just tell you, my background, my Baptist heritage and all, I find verses like this very difficult. Well, we've made fun of people who had prayer cloths and 
all those sort of things. The scripture says that God can work that way. I've not seen that. But I'll tell you, I, I think we might. I think it's uh, an exciting thing just to probe into that and say, okay, God, this is not foreign to the way you have worked in the past. We may see that again. Just because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was present in Paul's life. Verse 13, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So this is natural, isn't it? Everybody wants in on it. When, when you get the, the parade going, everybody wants on the bandwagon, right? And so some of these who were not believers... They jumped on board and they started using the same tactics and the same words and the same things to, uh, to express what was happening. And uh, they would say, I command you by the, by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Interesting next verse. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them... I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Kind of scary, isn't it? What they do? The men who had the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. Don't do it in your power. Or don't do it in the power of the Holy Spirit in somebody else. This is a personal thing. Salvation is a personal thing. You don't get saved because you're in a Christian family or because you go to a church. It's a personal thing. It has to do with you and your personal relationship with God. And I believe the empowering from the Holy Spirit is the same exact way. <coughs> Excuse me. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. So, yeah, news traveled fast. Uh, it's probably put on Facebook every few minutes. Then fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. This became known... Oh, excuse me. That's it. This end of that story... What does the power of the Holy Spirit really have to say for us? Well, it's a personal thing. I don't know that I'm very qualified to deal in this area, but I'm intrigued in what God is wanting to do. I feel in my spirit that God is ready to work with his people. I see a yearning in people's hearts to know God. I see people who are coming and wanting to, to dig into the scripture, not for personal knowledge, but to understand who God is. I believe that's a working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had to work in Paul over a period of time before he came to this point. And now with boldness, he is able to stand and administer uh, the Word of God, explaining to them about the Holy Spirit and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit, and following that great display of the power of God. I don't know about you, but I'd like to see that. I have a longing in my heart for God to work miracles. You know, I, I would really like to see God heal uh, people who, who have infirmities. I'd like to see God heal people who are dealing with addictions and, and problems in their lives. I would like to see God change lives miraculously. I'd like to see some of these miracles that I believe we're going to see. 
I think it takes God's people yearning, wanting, desiring, praying for, seeking, asking God for, for it to happen. I don't think God's just going to pour it out. I think it's together we work on this. So I want to increase my desire, my prayer life, my intensity in studying His Word, my application of that into my lifestyle so that I might become a fit vessel for the miracles of God to be displayed in my life. And I feel like I'm gathered with a group of people who are like-minded and want that. I want to see the Holy Spirit fall on this place. I want to see the power come to fruition in our lives. I want to see the peace that comes. You know, as I look back at Paul and Silas, and I realize that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they go into places of adversity. They speak in the town square knowing that they're going to be arrested or beaten or stoned to death. It's not that they're exceptionally brave. I think it's that they trust God. They're thrown in prison in Philippi a couple of chapters back. And what are they doing? They're doing the same thing they were doing out there. They're singing and praising God and lifting their voice. They're midnight. They're proclaiming the gospel message to all those that are around them. What are they doing? They're sharing that. Look, guys, we have peace about where we are. We're all right. If we die, we go to be with the Lord. If we live, we're going to proclaim His salvation. Doesn't really matter. It's that kind of inner joy and that peace that I believe just comes from the Holy Spirit. I think that's the beginning of it. I think when we get that calm, peace, in tumultuous times, turbulent times, and we can stand and say, you know, God, I'm watching for the direction you're going to take me. I'm going to go that way, regardless of the consequences. I believe God's going to work miracles. If you look logically at the book of Acts and you look at Paul's life, there is no way he should have survived that. He, he was so close to death so many times. It's unreal. And if he would have gotten killed, half of our New Testament wouldn't be here. Half of what we know about God, we wouldn't have had. God had a purpose in his life, and he brought him through that. Now, I realize that there are others that were martyred right off. And there's the possibility we would have had more knowledge and more understanding from what they wrote. But God has given us what we need when we need it. I believe God will give us in the future what we need when we need it. Maybe not in advance. But what we have to have, first of all, is that calm assurance of who He is and who we are in Him. I believe Paul knew that. I believe that's the reason that people like Silas and Barnabas and John Mark and, and a whole bunch of the others were so attracted and wanted to go on these missionary journeys with Him. Oh yeah, I think they probably wanted to see the miraculous things that were going to happen. But I think that they knew this little guy 
Saul, intellectual, from the Ivy League studies, student of the most elite of the teachers, was brave and strong and forceful because he trusted God. Not that he was a man's man and could win in a fight. No. Because he had the Holy Spirit in his life. He knew the Word. He trusted God. He walked out his faith. Praise God that we have the teachings that Paul has brought to us. Now as we implement that, not just as stories of this man who was in a Philippian jail and there was an earthquake and he got out. But as we implement this about the peace and the comfort and the joy that he had in his life that gave him the courage to sing hymns at midnight in the jail and not worry about the torture that he was going to receive. Just looking at the glory of God. When we come to that point, I believe God will take us a next step. Your next step may be different than my next step. I don't know what it's going to be. But we need to walk that path. We need to come to the point of saying, God, I'm okay where you've put me. If I'm in jail for proclaiming your message, that's okay. Father, if you put me in front of the Sanhedrin to be able to speak to the elite, I trust you for the words you'll put in my mouth. If I stand before family and friends, I trust you that you'll give me wisdom and the right words to say. God, I'm okay where you've put me. Help me to bloom. Help me to blossom. Help me to be the person that you've called me to be. I believe that's what the book of Acts is teaching me as we see the miracles of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. I challenge you now to look at this maybe even in a different light and examine as we read, continue to read through the book of Acts, the acts of the Holy Spirit. Is it possible for us to receive that same miraculous power? Yes. God hasn't changed. God wants the very best for us. We're the ones who are not where we need to be, not God. So let's move into the position that God will be able to use us and speak through us and heal and perform miracles in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings you've given of this day. Lord, I'm challenged by Paul's words and by how he stood firm on his convictions. Lord, of how you used him in a powerful way. Father, I'd like to be like Paul. Speak into my life. Touch my heart. Give me a heart as Paul had to go and to share. Week after week he went to the synagogue. Some believed, most didn't. But he kept going and he had faith. And in the midst of adversity, he sang hymns and he prayed and he praised you. Father, give me that understanding. Help me to be strong. 
Give me strength, understanding. Father, as a congregation, open our eyes to what's going on around us. Help us to understand where we are. Help us to realize the importance of drawing close, allowing you to be number one in our lives. Not just number one, but ekad, at one. That we may think like you think, that we may act like you act, that we may be as you are, for you've said that you are holy and that you want us to be holy. So Father, in my strength, I can't do that. So I surrender to you. Now I ask, Lord, that you bless us as a congregation as we seek your leadership, as we draw near, as we come face to face with you. Father, bless us. Give us strength. Empower us with your Holy Spirit. Let your Holy Spirit fall on us. We pray these things in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, and humbly say, Amen and Amen. May God bless you.